by the way, check out that term right there, lumbar endoscopic spine surgery. The acronym is LESS. And you have to admit, that is a very cool name for a mal-invasive procedure. So I encourage you guys to use that sort of like the way we use MIST lift, but th that's just me. But what I want to talk about is the good, the bad, and the ugly of the like the day-to-day -day developing an endoscopic spine practice. So let me start out by just saying I'm a, I have lots of potential conflicts because uh, I help a lot of companies develop their MI systems, including Eloquence. But I'll try to be objective. So let me just start out by saying uh, I did a lot of different kinds of surgeries. I'm trained as an open surgeon, and I love my endoscopic spine practice because my patients love this surgery, and they are some of my happiest patients. And I don't care what surgery I do, if patients don't do well, I can't sleep at night. So it begs the question, if endoscopic surgery is so great, why am I the only one in San Diego doing it, even after all these years, even, even after all my efforts to try to get other people to do it? Because I'm an extrovert. I don't want to be the only one in San Diego doing this. And I've been trying very hard without much luck. And I think this is a very complicated question, but there's two <laughs> reasons. The first is reimbursement issues, and the second is the learning curve. So let me start out by addressing the learning curve and hopefully try to put some insight as to what we can do to get this adoption rate higher um, so that other people develop endoscopic practices. And here's the mother of all papers. This is the original paper that talks about the endoscopic learning curve. 72 cases, that's an incredible number. And since then, there's been many other studies. And essentially, it's anywhere from like 20 to 72. It's still a lot. If you look at microdiscectomy, which is much older data, so it's not a fair comparison, but I mean, it's much easier, even in the literature. But I, don't, I think the whole story, that's not the whole story, just looking at this kind of, these papers. And let me just show you some examples of two cases that I did in the last couple of weeks. So here's the first patient, two-level spondy, four or five severe stenosis, and a far lateral disc herniation at L5-S1. So I did a endoscopic decompression and a transramal discectomy, which took three and a half hours, okay? So one of the things is that when you do surgery, there's some degree of consistency that you want. And I was talking to one of my colleagues that, are, that I just have tons of respect for. And one of the things is that he does like five, six cases a day. He doesn't have the, the freedom to let a case go three and a half hours like I do, because uh, I don't care. I just book two cases a day. Now, look at this patient, patient number two. Kind of similar. Two-level spondy, three-level stenosis. Um, this patient has slightly different symptomatology, and this patient's older, but I did a wholly, totally different surgery. That one. <laughs> That looks like a lot more work. It's three levels, plus I'm putting in screws and cages. Guess how long that surgery took me? Four hours, practically the same amount of time. So it's not just the difficulty of adopting the learning curve. I think part of the difficulty is knowing that every once in a while, you're going to get into a situation where things are going to take a lot longer than you think. And in, when in open, in many open surgery, that doesn't happen very often. So I don't know exactly how to deal with that, but I think we need to start asking more questions because we keep saying that the learning curve is difficult. We need to ask why, and I wish some of you were here early in the morning because the SRG group is gonna be, this is the first time I really felt like other people are asking the question because this is not gonna be an easy thing to uh, answer. But in addition to why, we have to take the next step, which is then say, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to improve it? And as a matter of trying to help people that are developing their endoscopic practice, dealing with this, here's the way I just think about it. I don't know if this is the right way, but I like to think of it from the end in mind. Whatever you do, when you start your practice, make sure that the first few cases go well, no matter what it takes. And I'll just give you an example of what you should do. You should follow a very, very detailed technique guide. And you need to practice a lot. It would be like learning how to play the violin or golf, OK? You can't just willy-nilly try to see a few YouTube videos and think you can do it. And then what I noticed is that people try to learn 
techniques from five different people, and then they take those five different techniques and mesh it all into one and try to put it all together in the first few cases. And my guess is, is that when you first start, learn one technique from one surgeon that has done it a lot, and don't change one thing in five cases. If you make it through past three cases without changing anything, I'll be surprised, because surgeons, I found, are incredibly creative, and um, they think they know everything. And then here's what's interesting. When you pick a case, for, for example, for transramal cases, everyone wants to wait until they have a foraminal or far lateral disc herniation. But to say that this is the best indication for a surgery, so transramal endoscopic surgery is one of the best applications for that kind of problem. But that is not the same thing as saying that's the easiest first case, because it just turns out that a far lateral or foraminal disc herniation for your first case is actually much harder than a posterolateral extruded disc herniation. So picking a really good, easy first few cases is vital to make sure that you do it, because if the first case doesn't go well, you're never going to do a second case. If the first five cases go well and then you have a problem on your sixth case, my bet is that you'll probably decide, I know what I did wrong and I'll do a seventh case. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest things that I see. I try very hard to encourage people to send me the picture of the first few cases that they do. And if I see something that they want to do like a far lateral, I warn them. They probably still will do it. But if they have trouble, I can go like this. I told you. <laughs> So, and then here's the other mundane thing. When you first start doing surgeries that no one else in the hospital has started doing, getting things set up so you, when you get to the OR, you don't have to worry about where everything is. is a really important thing. So this kind of mundane preparation for your first few cases is probably low-hanging fruit that we never pay attention to because we're just worried about the pathology. And things like... Just holding the instruments. So what I noticed recently when I'm really paying attention to how surgeons adopt the technique in the cadaver lab, I get really seasick because the scope is just going all over the place. And that's my criteria. If I start getting seasick, I just tell them, slow down. You got to be able to hold the camera still so I don't get seasick. And a lot of it has to do with just holding that scope. Look at that. I've got my pinky out. I've got my hands flared. That's not something that you just normally know how to do inherently. It would be like, here's a violin, you watch some YouTube videos, now play a song. Not that easy. And I'll give you an example. If you're doing uniportal surgery and you need to read the, perifer the periphery of your surgical target site using a curved instrument, everyone bends the instrument because naturally we just think we can just lean over. But sometimes you're in a really restricted surgical corridor and you have to use the curve of a uh, needle to get to the periphery, and when you do that, you have to rotate it. So just having them practice this maneuver, I've noticed, makes a big difference. We need to do studies to see if that works in terms of improving the learning curve, but these are the mundane things that we never think about that may have a big effect. And then simple things like the day of surgery, so I'll give you an example. Just setting up the room so that you're not standing looking backwards and uncomfortable is a huge thing. Maybe not in your 10th, 15th case, but on your first five cases, knowing how to set up the room so that that's not something you have to worry about when you walk in the door. Somebody else is worrying about that. You just need something like this or a diagram and you need to give it to somebody so that that's all set up. And then same thing. I, like every case that I do, there has to be a checklist and the checklist has to be checked because if one thing's missing in the middle of surgery, I'm like a Formula One driver in a pit stop. If somebody forgets the gun to put the wheel in, I'm not gonna just be saying, oh, it's okay, take your time. I'm gonna be freaking out. Mm -hmm. So that's really cumbersome and people hate to do that. So something as simple as, you know what? It's 2025, make something electronic. Because the problem with checklists is, is that the first 99 things is really easy. It's that one thing that's sitting there on the fifth page that you forget about. So having something as simple as, as you check things off, they disappear so that what's missing is at the top of the list. And I can just go on and on and on. The second thing is reimbursement. That is something is gonna be a very short discussion because I have no idea how to deal with that. But here's my take on it. <laughs> the first is the obstacle are the fact that we have a lot of hospital administrators that basically, they're just growing in numbers. They completely outweigh us and I remember the day when I used to be, they used to be scared of me. Now I'm scared of them. <laughs> and they now tell me how to take care of patients they're getting bigger in number. Hospitals are consolidating. And I call them the dark side of the forest 
that force continues to get stronger. It's like a black hole. Same thing with insurance companies. They're paying us a little bit less every year. They make everything more difficult. I think everyone knows that with the recent thing in, that happened in New York. And they also try to tell me how to take care of patients. And in the terms of endoscopic surgery, they just simply by do it by either denying coverage or paying me so little or paying the facility so little that it makes it a very difficult burden to overcome. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's not only a few insurance companies too. So they're consolidating, they're getting much more emboldened, and they really aren't afraid of me either. 20 years ago, I could yell at somebody on the phone and they would always give in, but now it's, it's not, it's, they're like a wall. And that's yet another dark side of the forest that also continues to get stronger. So having seen this landscape, what have I done to make my practice awesome? Because I really have an awesome practice now. The first is get away from hospital administrators. You can't get rid of them completely, but if you go to the ASC, everything's smaller. You often have some more stake in it. You have a lot more say in what's going on. And this is a freight train coming, so it's not something we even need to talk about. This is the hardest part. So what I decided is, what happens if I go out of network and just be a private pay doctor? And I did this incrementally, and I have to tell you, I was petrified to do this, because I'm trained like a traditional open surgeon, being busy, um, taking insurance, and being used to having a three-month wait, and like not being able to keep up with my surgical log. That's my kind of comfort zone, believe it or not. That's really pathologic when you think about it. But, but you guys are all probably exactly like that. Now, here's what happened. Something simple. I started posting some videos on, on, on the internet. And little by little, as I looked at what percentage of my overall surgeries became private pay, I noticed that it started growing and growing and growing. That red arrow represents the time when COVID hit, and I had three weeks of nothing to do and I decided, I think I'm gonna post more videos. And look what happened. The rate at which I increased my private pay surgeries was directly proportional to the number of videos that I put in there. And these are just like videos on my iPhone. And in the end, as scared as I was, it turned out that converting my in-network practice where I was trying to do like three, 400 cases a year, which is low by the way. When I say three, 400 cases a year, they're like, Puh, I do five to 600. I just do 200 now. It ended up being a lot easier than I thought. Now, there's got to be more than that because that is not a long-term solution to the problem. So that's why I came here despite the forces of evil. So this meeting directly collided with my summer like practice event party, the biggest one that I was about to plan for 100 people. And I had to cancel it. I had to tell those 100 people, like, oh, by the way, forget, I, we're not having that party this year. We rented out like a big area of soccer suites. So this is how important this effort is. So this is my way of saying to Christoph and, and Mark and uh, um, so, It's a hard name to say. Yes, Sadiq. Soccer. <laughs> It's close. Yeah, yeah, and good. everyone else that's really, really involved in this organization, <laughs> this is the first time I've had the same feeling that I had when ESMIS was just starting out. So we have to be, we have to have some advocacy. And by the way, this is an interesting time, not only because it's exciting, but all the best social media people are in this room in Spine. So um, um, everyone should be afraid. But we obviously have a lot of work to do, but it is worthwhile work because the future is gonna be bright because when you take good care of patients, it's, it's gratifying. So here's what I think. Do you know that in knee surgery, there's two types of surgeons? There's the knee arthroscopy sports guys, and then there's the knee replacement guys and gals. They work in the hospital. The happiest surgeons that I know are by far the ortho sports doctors for a variety of reasons. So just think about the future. I think it's very likely that in spine, there's gonna be two types of surgeons. There's gonna be some surgeons that like to do all these crazy complex cases, especially early on in their career when they're dumb and they don't know any better. <laughs> to work in the hospital, work in the academics, and do all these really challenging cases. But as you start to think about your family and your time and your everything else, 
it will be very difficult to not to gravitate toward a, a practice where you're gonna be like the ortho sports people. Now imagine this, you own a surgery center. You already have to buy an endoscope.